something must be happening. Everybody got quiet. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I am Sue Copen Katzif. I am a member of the board of the Journalism Alumni Network. We are part of the University of Maryland Alumni Association. So for those of you who are alums either here or who are watching us uh, on Zoom, uh, hopefully if you're not a member, you will consider joining because you get automatic membership in the Journalism Alumni Network and we will be you know, happy to connect with you. Uh, just a little bit about me. I graduated, I'm one of the old ones, I graduated in 1976 um, and I was an instructor here. I was an adjunct instructor for 10 years and I was the CNS Bureau Director and I was here for a total of um, broadcast. Um, let's see, I came in in uh, 1999 and I retired from the university in 2019, but I haven't retired because I'm now reporting again for Maryland Public Television. So kind of what goes around comes around. Um, Let's see, we are going to be, um, this is our kickoff program for this year, as you can imagine. We are a relatively new organization and with the pandemic, it's been difficult. We've had Zoom programs and uh, virtual other activities, but we're hoping to do more of these kinds of things and have students engaged with the alums. In fact, we are working with the college to create a mentoring program. And students, uh, you should have gotten information about that if it got lost in the flood of emails I know you all get. Uh, go back and see if you can find it because our alumni are looking for the opportunity to mentor with you. It's a terrific opportunity. So that is one of the projects we are uh, getting ready to gear up with. Uh, we also are looking forward to get, particularly alums, your ideas and feedback. You'll notice that on the whiteboards on either side, I don't know if you are watching from other locations can see it, but we do have a Gmail address. It is Merrill College Alumni at Gmail, pretty simple. If you're interested, if you have questions, if you have uh, recommendations, anything uh, in any way that you'd like to get uh, involved, and, and students too, if you are, uh, particularly if you're graduating this year, uh, we would love to hear from you to, to bring you on board. We, uh, we like to interact with the students as much as possible, absolutely. Uh, and at this point in time, I'm not gonna chew up any more as far as uh, just remind you that if you wanna tweet, we would encourage you. Uh, social media is a good thing, and so feel free to do that. We will be taking questions from both you and from some of the folks who are watching um, outside of campus. So we will uh, maximize the time for questions. So with that in mind, let me introduce both our student moderator and our special guest. Our moderator, if Deanna would stand, is Deanna Giles, or is it Giles? I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your last name. Giles. Uh, she is studying broadcast journalism, a master's student, is originally from Minnesota. She has her bachelor's degree in English and communication studies. Like Mara, she is now in the Capital News Service Broadcast Bureau graduating this December, correct? Yes. And she also says she enjoys singing, dancing, and making memories with friends. All very good grounding for journalists who sometimes forget about having a life. Our featured guest, um, it really gives me great pride to be able to, to have her come back. Mara Schiavocampo was in our first CNS Broadcast Bureau. She is a native of Maryland from Montgomery County. She did her undergrad work at another college out in California, USC. Oh, I'm sorry, I, oh, you're right, I meant to, you know what, I checked it was UCLA. I know there's a, I have a friend of mine who works at USC, but she's a UCLA grad. It is not pretty, um, from UCLA. She got her master's, as I said, from Merrill College. Um, you should know from the literature that we put out about the program, the Mara is a four-time Emmy winner. She has reported for two networks. Most recently, you could find Mara appearing on a regular basis on CNN's Reliable Sources. I'm hoping she might address that uh, demise of what I thought was a pretty interesting show um, and what that has done to the discourse about journalism and the impact. Other awards, that, and she has a lot of them, include Marie Claire Magazine's Women on Top Award for Media, NABJ's Emerging Journalist of the Year, and she also has seven telly awards behind her. What many of you probably don't know, and I've told Mara that I was really gonna emphasize this because you have to find your own path in, in many ways, and Mara really did. Uh, and that's also, it makes me just such a big admirer of her. 
Mara was a trailblazer in digital media at a time when it really, it was just in its, for the most part, its infancy, I would say, safe to say. And she just grabbed onto that and ran with it. And that's all I'm going to say. But I want Mara to talk about that. It is, um, and it has helped to guide her career along the way. And all of us have twists and turns. And so that kind of also is, is true for Mara. There will be, for those of you, again, I want to remind you watching online to please, if you have questions, feel free to submit them. You can, can do that, as you well know, on Zoom. Um, the program, of course, is being recorded if you want to go back and look at it or if someone has some need to refer to it and tell somebody about it and where can they find it, it will be on the Merrill College's YouTube page. So you can find it there. So without further ado, it is truly an absolute pleasure and great pride that I present this evening's conversation with Merrill alumna, Mara Siavo Campo. Guys, so I'm very excited to be here for this first uh, conversation. This is, and and we are back in person, um, in all things, which is very very exciting. Um, I found a list the other day in my house that my daughter made with me at the height of COVID when we couldn't leave the house or do anything of things we wanted to do when COVID was over. And so that reminded me of all of the things that we took for granted at one time um, that we can now do again. And, and I just, I, I appreciate them and I stop and savor them, like being able to join all of you in person. And also hello to everybody um, who is joining us on the Zoom. So um, I will speak a little bit kind of about my path. I, I don't love talking about myself too much or for too long. Um, I'd much rather answer questions. So I understand there are some questions that have been submitted. Please, you know, don't be shy. You're journalists, you're aspiring reporters. You can't be too shy to come up and ask a question if you have it. Um, and please feel free to ask me anything. Um, I'm happy to, you know, chat about whatever. And if I don't want to talk about it, I'll tell you that too. So um, just uh, let me start with kind of the, the background and the path. And I will, you know, Sue wanted me to focus on kind of the digital journalism aspect. And I certainly will um, touch upon that as well. So I got my, um, my undergrad. I went to, uh, to UCLA for undergrad. I got my bachelor's at UCLA in communications. And then I came to the University of Maryland for um, my master's in broadcast journalism. Now, the way I ended up in broadcast journalism is a little bit funny because on my application for the University of Maryland, at that time, on the top, it asked you to identify your area of interest. And it was broadcast, print, or, or online. And by accident, I checked broadcast. And so I did not realize that until the first day of school when I was in the studio and it was dark because there were no windows in the studio and it was cold because you have to keep air conditioning on for the equipment and it was like kind of dark with the lights because the studio lights weren't on and I just thought like this is a terrible mistake I have to get out of here I have to find a way to get back to like a different track like print or online but I don't want to be here and that quickly changed when we started doing production and I fell in love with the magic of television um, because there is a magic to television, which I started to feel and see more and more as I, you know, spent time in the work, working newsrooms. And that combined with journalism, which was what I was already interested in, made it very clear to me that I wanted to um, stay in the TV space. So that was an incredibly serendipitous mistake that I made in checking that wrong box. Um, so I did my uh, master's here at Maryland. I was part of the first group uh, of CNS, and at the time it looked a little bit different. So we were, we were all one group, and we had different jobs that we would rotate. So you might be a producer one day, you might be reporting another day, you might be shooting for a reporter um, on another day and kind of taking more of the shooting editing role. Um, you might be doing production like directing or TD uh, or camera operator in the studio or anchoring. There was just, we, we did a little bit of everything. And that was tremendously helpful because it gave me an understanding of what everybody's job in the newsroom is. And I never have taken that for granted because understanding what everybody's doing around you helps you serve the team that much better. You know, as I was telling some of the young ladies here before, if you know what the producer's job is, it makes you a better reporter and it makes you a reporter that producers love because it, you, you, it is clear that you understand what they need and you all work together much better. I also got all of the skills that I would later use in my digital journalism career, which was knowing how to shoot 
and edit and write and report on my own. That was not something that seemed overwhelming or foreign to me when I entered the workforce because we had been doing it here day after day, month after month. So those are such incredibly important skills that you're getting. And I never found anybody in the workforce, any of my peers that was better prepared than me, not one person. So I cannot say enough about how amazing the training and the exposure that you are getting is here. It is truly, truly invaluable once you get out into the workforce. Um, so when I left here, my first job was at CBS News in New York um, as an associate producer. And I was at NewsPath, which is CBS's wire service. So basically that consisted of watching video and like logging tape. Like when we would transcribe, we literally would transcribe. Like I know now there's transcription services, but then like to get something transcribed, you had to have the actual tape and take it to the transcription department and it was like a whole thing. So it was just easier to have the APs do it. So I would transcribe, we would write little summaries of the video and the like. And then CBS started producing the news breaks for MTVU. What is MTVU? So MTVU is MTV College Network. It started at that time. It didn't exist prior, it was something else. Then it became MTVU. So CBS started doing the news for them. They needed somebody to produce their news and they hired CBS for that. So because I was already at CBS, I heard, I was sitting next to somebody who was talking to an applicant for that job. And they were telling them everything they needed to do to apply for the job and also what the qualifications were. And I was thinking to myself while well, I was eavesdropping, well, that sounds like a job I would want. And I also, it also sounds like I'm qualified for that job. So as soon as he got off the phone, I said, well, I want to apply for the job. So he sent me out. He said, okay, I'll send you out with a network cameraman for one day to shoot your reel. And then I will assign you an editor for one shift to cut your reel which I realize now was incredibly generous because I had a network cameraman and a network editor editing my reel. Um, and so I got that job. So that was my first reporting job. So I was a reporter and anchor for MTVU. Um, and that was basically in studio reporting. So we were putting together news breaks. We were putting together a little bit of sports. I know nothing about sports. That was quite a stretch for me, um, but a little bit of everything. Um, from there, I went to local news in Westchester, New York, which is a suburb of New York City, because I lived in New York City and I really didn't want to leave because that was my, my home now at this point in time. But it's very hard to get reporting jobs, you know, because New York's the number one market in the country. So I went to a very small station in Westchester um, doing reporting and anchoring, and I didn't love it. And I knew that it wasn't the journalism that I didn't love and it wasn't, you know, the reporting that I didn't love. It was the content. I just didn't love you know, the area that I was covering. I didn't love the kinds of stories that I was covering. And I thought to myself, well, what do you really want to do? If you know you love journalism, you know you love storytelling, you know you love reporting, but you don't love this kind of reporting, what do you want to report on? And I really wanted to do international news. And so I was young enough and naive enough and responsibility free enough to say, well, I'm just gonna quit my job and buy a plane ticket to Jordan, duh. And so, <laughs> I quit my job and I bought a plane ticket to Jordan and I knew one person there he worked for the tourism board and so I asked him if he would like take me around and introduce me to people so that I could figure out what I wanted to report on and that was my first um, digital journalism reporting trip I bought equipment that I could fit in a backpack small enough to put in the overhead bin of the airplane because I was afraid of losing my equipment by checking it because if I lost my equipment, I couldn't work. So whatever I packed, I had to be able to take with me. So that meant really condensing my kit to a big backpack. I also didn't have a lot of money. So I remember I bought a pirated copy of Final Cut Pro from somebody on Craigslist and I met him in the street like a drug deal. It was like, here's the money, you know, here's your CDs. Um, and that's how I got Final Cut Pro. So I put all of this stuff together in a backpack and I went to Jordan and I spent three weeks in the Middle East. And this friend of mine took me around. But when I say took me around, we went all over the Middle East. I mean, the great thing about the Middle East is countries are pretty close together. So we drove to Syria, we drove to Lebanon. You know, we were in Jordan, we went to the border with Iraq and I just was gathering. I didn't really have a plan at that point, I didn't know exactly what stories I was working on. I didn't know who was going to sell them to. I didn't know how much to charge. I was just news gathering. It was an incredibly inefficient way to work, but it was part of the process of learning how to work more efficiently. So I spent three weeks doing that. 
And I came home and I started to kind of identify stories within all the things that I, all the material. And then I said, well, I have to figure out how to sell this stuff. So that's when I started learning, you know, the actual business of being an independent journalism, a journalist, which is, you know, contacting people and, you know, harassing them for an answer, yes or no, on your pitches. And, and then I realized the proper workflow, meaning the workflow that made the most sense financially, because I worked on, a, I shot a lot of stuff that I did not use. That's a waste of time, which is a waste of money. So I learned that it made a lot more sense to have accepted pitches before I went somewhere and then I knew exactly what my budget was, how much I was going to get paid for them, what I was working on, the elements I needed for those stories. I could commit myself to those. And then I would go and collect all the elements that I needed in the field, in the field, so to speak, and then come back and do all the post-production. So all of the, um, you know, the tape logging, the writing, the reporting, the editing, all of it. So at that time, n really nobody else was doing this. There maybe were like a dozen of us if like if that's might be a stretch in and of itself um and it was it there were so few of us that i was you kind of inserting myself into these communities of photographers because freelance photographers had a lot of the same challenges that i had and so i could lean on them for help like how do i find a fixer in this country and you know how do you handle this technical issue and what about batteries you know i can't they they're limiting how many batteries you can put in a carry-on so so i would get some of that guidance from photographers but i say that to say there were so few people doing it that i had to kind of put together you know advisors from other areas to to figure out how to how to make it work um, so I did that for about two years. I went all over the world. It was truly some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. I did a lot of trips to the Middle East because the Middle East was very marketable at that time um, because we were, it was right during the Iraq war. So you could sell pretty much anything from the Middle East. And so I, and I like that part of the world a lot. And so I would travel there um, frequently because I knew I could sell assignments from the Middle East. Um, I did Russia, I did, Africa and Congo. I went to Indonesia. Um, I really just, it's almost like I threw a dart at the map and I would see like if, if I thought this place was cool and then I would do some research to determine if I thought I could sell pieces from this place and then I would put pitches out and feelers and if I got enough interest it was like okay great we're going to the sulfur mine in Indonesia let's do it. Um, and I also learned that the kind of the key financially to making a freelance career work is you got to squeeze as much as you can from every trip. So if I'm doing, you know, a piece on this, can I pivot like two degrees to the right, slightly change it, do, you know, a couple different sources, maybe same interviews, but different, different quotes, and then sell it as a print piece to this person. And can I do something for NPR? You know, it was just trying to figure out how to take the one piece and, and split it up in as many pieces as possible. So I did that for um, a few years. And then because of that work, I won the Emerging Journalist Award um, from the National Association of Black Journalists. And um, at that award ceremony were all of the executives from all the networks. And th that was very much my kind of Cinderella moment because I won this award, all of my work was displayed in front of all of these executives and then literally that was on a Saturday and like by Tuesday they were all calling me. And so I got offers from everybody and I went to NBC. So I spent um, seven years at NBC, initially as their first ever digital correspondent, where I was doing exactly the same work that I'd been doing, but at the network. And it was an interesting experiment because the, the, the problem that I found is that the, the, the way that digital journalism lends itself best to storytelling, you need time. You cannot do a 50 second, a minute, 10 second piece as a non-traditional journalist. There's a reason that we use track in packages. It's extremely efficient. You can convey a lot of information in 10, 15 seconds. That wasn't the style of journalism I had been doing. I was doing more documentary style journalism. You need time to breathe. You might have, you know, 15 seconds of a gnat pop of someone doing something. That's unheard of. You're lucky if you get a two second gnat pop in, in no network piece. And so we tried it for a few years. It was interesting for me. It was interesting for them. It was a lot of trying to learning from each other. And then I transitioned to traditional correspondent work. So that's when I started doing the, you know, living on the road. Um, so I spent about four years living on the road, nine months a year traveling. 
uh, get a call right now. It's 722. Can you be on a flight at 10? Uh, you know, get a call at 11 p.m. We need you to drive three hours to this place. Get a call at 2 in the morning. You got to get up. You got to drive two hours here. Can you be live for the Today Show at 7 a.m.? Um, that was my life for a couple years, and I loved it. I truly thought I was getting away with something. I was like, are these people going to realize that they are paying me to travel the world? Like, when are they going to, like, yank me back and say, wait a minute, you've been getting over on us, you know? I just could not believe that this was my life because these were all things that I had been paying to do. I had been spending my own money to do the same thing, and now somebody was paying me and covering all my expenses. It just seemed too good to be true. But that's a burnout job, and living on the road is very, very, very difficult. Some people love it, and they will do it their entire career. But for me, I got very burnt out, and so I really wanted something that was a little bit more, like at least so I could plan my life, you know, where everything didn't have to be written in pencil, where I could actually write plans down in pen. And I really, really desperately wanted that, and so I transitioned more to anchoring and in-studio in work. Um, and that also coincided with the time that I started having children, which was very um, convenient because I could be home a little bit more for them. Um, I did the overnight newscast for NBC. Well, I, the newscast aired at 5 a.m., but you know we worked overnight to prepare for the newscast. So that was great for parenting because I always would joke that my daughter didn't even know I had a job because I would leave after she was asleep and I would be home before she woke up. So as far as she was concerned, you know, mommy did nothing. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> So I did that and then I went to ABC and I spent four years at ABC, um, again, doing correspondent work. And when I left ABC, I really knew that I did not want another general assignment correspondent job um, ever again because it just felt like for me personally, that time in my life was over. It wasn't exciting me anymore. It felt like, you know, okay, another winter, another snow story, another summer, another heat story, another fall, another flood story. I felt like it was plug and play. I was not inspired at all. Um, and I also found that as the media landscape was changing, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, the network contracts made less and less sense to me. So network contracts are ironclad exclusive they own your likeness they own your ip they own your voice if you create something while you're there they own it if you have an idea while you're there they own it and it seemed very incongruous with the way that media works today which is all of these kind of tiny media moguls creating youtube content um, you know creating a course that they want to sell on their website uh, monetizing social media and it, you know, creating a podcast. It, there are so many people doing so many things that those contracts for me didn't make sense because I wanted to be able to do more and I wanted to do it in a way that I owned it. So if you, you know, when you create something, so I created a podcast at ABC that debuted at number one on the health charts. I could not take that podcast with me. I could not take the RSS, the RSS feed. I could not take my audience. I could, you just, that's the way those contracts work. And so um, I wanted more freedom and more ownership. So I made the decision to not seek um, another network job, but I very much wanted to continue to work with networks in a contract capacity. So basically that's what I do now. So typical freelance work is, you know, freelance being you sell a story at a time. That's what I was doing earlier in my career. I do more kind of contract-based freelance, so project-based, if you will. So I had a two-year contract with iHeart to create a podcast for them. It did very well. It was number one on the iTunes charts twice. So that was a project that I completed. I just signed on to do a project for TV One, so we just shot season one. It debuts on September 30th. Um, I do a lot of contributing work for cable news. I uh, had a contract with the Dr. Oz show before his um, entry into politics. So I have multiple contracts at any given point in time. Um, it's great because I control my time. Um, I only say yes to things that I'm excited about, which means that when I'm working, I'm really excited about whatever I'm working on. Um, and then the downside is that you eat what you kill. And if you don't kill anything, you don't eat. I have had years where I made more money than I did at the networks, and I've had years where I've made less. So it's, you know, you really have to, it's much easier to get a check, much easier to get a check but I'm much happier eating what I kill. So that's me. <laughs> and uh, now I would love to open it up to questions. Um, and I, I would love to hear what you guys are, are interested in knowing more about.
Hi, I'm Aaron Arnstein. I'm a junior here at Merrill College. And uh, my question to you is, when you were a master's student here at Maryland, is there anything you would change journalism-wise that you that, that you change journalism-wise that you think would help you in your future career, now present career? That is a very good question. I wish I would have studied more politics and history. So if you have the opportunity to take politics, history, and economics, um, if you have the opportunity, like if you have electives, things that you have a little bit of choice on, flexibility on, take things that have nothing to do with journalism because those things are really going to inform your work. No matter what area of journalism you go into, politics, history, and economics will make you better at it. And I wish I had done more of that. And I'm spending a lot of time now kind of recreating you know, the education I never got in college because all I was doing was taking communications and journalism classes. So now, in my free time, I'm always reading history, politics, and economics books. And I could have done that then and be reading like summer beach reads now, but you know, I didn't. <laughs> awesome, thank you. My name is John Ariel Diso. I'm a second year master's student in broadcast journalism. I wanted to ask you, as far as work ethic is concerned, what distinguishes your work to make it award winning and what advice would you give us in terms of, you know, distinguishing ourselves, going the extra mile? What do you do? That's a great question um, because it, it is very, very important to find some way to set yourself apart from the pack. And that's what I was able to do very successfully with my digital journalism work. That was not my intention. I, it was very much accidental in the sense that I wasn't planning to chart a new course. I just wanted to do work that I was passionate about. And because I couldn't hire a crew, I couldn't hire all the people I needed because I didn't have any money, I had to do it all myself. And I had to figure out a way to make it small so it could fit in the overhead bin. So all of this stuff was a function of necessity. But because of that, I did set myself apart from the pack because nobody was really doing that at that time. So, you know, there is some strategy involved in thinking about, you know, what's the, if you have like the, the diagram, you know, the overlapping circles and the intersection in the middle, what's the intersection of what you're really interested in and what's going to really be unique and, and set you apart? Um, and the other thing is just striving for excellence. I mean, it may sound like a cliche, but it, it, there's less excellence than you might think out there. And so if you strive to be excellent and you are anywhere close to excellent, you will set yourself apart just from that. Um, and consistency, you know, being consistently, consistently excellent. Um, I am of the belief, the strongly held belief, that the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. So if I agree to do it, I'm giving it 100%. I give 80%, 60%, 50%, 40% to nothing. Either it's 100% or I say no. So I think that's really important too, is that you give your all. And because we're journalists, I will tell you this, this has been a guiding force for me my entire career. It doesn't have to be good, it has to be done. The deadline is the priority, period. After that, you can make it excellent, but do not miss that deadline. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Johanna. I'm a junior uh, undergrad student. And my question is, as somebody who really thrives off the fast pace, the unpredictability, the what you've described as a burnout job, how would you suggest that somebody like me adjust that lifestyle to make it better for everyday life without losing the passion? Yeah, that's a really, really good question because there is, I think, you know, for better or for worse, this field tends to attract people who, you know, we are so driven by the moment and the good. And I could have, I did work 30 hours like without sleeping and you, I loved hopping on a plane and I, but you do bring yourself out. So, you know, everybody talks about balance, but I think it's really, really important that you identified, especially young. What are the things that give you joy? that you just do because they give you joy, period, for no other reason, no professionally redeeming value, just joy. What are the things that make you feel energized? You have to give those as much attention as you do your career because they will make you better at your career and they will make you a happier person. So you cannot exclude everything all for with this like tunnel vision of succeeding professionally. And I, I did that, so I'm telling you not to do what I did, but I didn't know better and then I got burnt out. So just re really I would focus on joy just make sure that you chase your joy in life that has nothing to do with work and I think if you if you insert enough joy in your life it will keep you energized um, in a way that kind of prevents that Hi, my name is Erin Burnett I'm a junior broadcast journalism major technology entrepreneurship minor um, so basically, hearing your entire career and the trajectory of how it went and the patterns within it, it kind of sounds like you almost like 
made your own job out of the structure, the current structure of the journalism industry at the time. So um, what I'm interested to know, like what your thoughts on the next generation of journalists are and what, what kind of new jobs or new innovations can come from that. Yeah, um, I, if I were coming out of school today or if I were advising someone who's coming out of school, i.e. you, um, I would say to really devote yourself to whether it's YouTube, whether it's a podcast, whether it's TikTok, whether it's whatever it is, there are so many avenues right now to create your own content that I would pick one and I tend to think of social media like a sport, right? Like sports, right? You can't like be excellent in baseball and hockey and football and soccer. Like Michael Jordan, well, he played many sports. He's probably a bad example, but like, you know, and I don't know sports figures, but somebody who's great in basketball is not necessarily great in football. My point being, I would focus on one, focus on YouTube, focus on a podcast, focus on TikTok, focus on Instagram, focus on it, commit to it, do your content. It actually doesn't even really matter much what the content is. It doesn't have to be news, but show that you can create content consistently that engages an audience that is growing. That is incredibly attractive to employers because that's what they're all trying to do. And so that is a, a really good way to set yourself apart from the pack. If you be, do you know weekly videos on vegan food, but you're showing that you can produce videos, you can do them on deadline, you can do them consistent, consistently, you engage with the comments, your audience is growing, that says a lot. So I would do that. Just put your foot on the gas and just run in one social media platform and whatever you're doing professionally, it will be aided by that. Hi, my name is Tallulah Pajai and I'm a junior journalism major with a minor in law and society as well as Spanish. And I was just going to ask, well, it, when it comes to like diversity in the newsroom, I know that like as a woman of color myself, my experiences do impact like my daily life. And it's also really hard because journalism thrives off of like not showing bias and keeping the reporter out of the story. Um, and I know that, like you just said, it's important to show our interests and the things that we care about in our reporting. How do you, I guess, find that balance of telling a story that's well informed by the fact that you've lived many of these experiences while also keeping it unbiased and making sure that you're being completely transparent with your audience? You know, I think there's there are a lot of conversations right now happening around that same question. So there's there's no easy answer because what we've come to, I think what a lot of people have come to understand and accept is that it, it is impossible to be unbiased because we're not robots. We all come from certain backgrounds. So whether that means you see things a certain way because you come from the South versus coming from the Northeast or going to an Ivy League college versus a community college or being a woman of color being versus a white man, we all see things through a different lens. And so I think it's far more helpful to kind of acknowledge the lens that we're seeing the world through um, and then using that as the starting point for your reporting. I mean, it certainly doesn't mean inserting judgment um, into your work, but it, an acknowledgement of what of your starting point, of your lens, of your life experience, and how that's informing your work. But I also think what's very, very important is bringing that to the newsroom in the most pivotal way, which is speaking out about what needs to be covered. And that is is such a, what newsrooms cover and don't cover is such a clear indication of our values as a society. And it's also the source of information for the majority of, of the country, right? People get their information from the media. So what you choose to cover is also the, it's the well from which everybody's you know, drawing their water. And how you cover it is, it, none of it is, is, we're not robots and we're not, consumers are not robots and the producers are not robots. And so the newsrooms need to be more diverse because we need someone like you saying, this is important to my community. This is being left out of the conversation. Did you ever think of it this way? And introducing new, you know, ways of looking at the same story. Um, and also, when you're doing the work, when you're interfacing with those communities, you know, you're you're going to do, uh, you're going to have certain ties in the community that are going to be much more helpful to a specific story than somebody who doesn't have those ties. It's a very, I, I know that was a little bit convoluted, but because you asked me like a, a huge question and one that we're all grappling with, we're all trying to figure 
that out, especially after what we've just been through, you know, politically over the last few years, we're all trying to figure out the answers to this. So I, I, I apologize if I, you know, didn't answer that clearly, but it's a great question because we're all trying to figure it out. That helps. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there, Steve Noverly, 2010 grad and a member of the Journalism Alumni Board. You talked a lot about sort of eating what you kill, and so I wonder what advice you have on how to hunt, mm. um, especially, you know, early in your career versus now, you know, being more established, the media landscape has changed. How do you, how do you make the kill? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the basis of it is relationships, period, point blank. It's um, having them, it's nurturing them, it's building them, it's, you know, keeping up with people as they, you know, transition through jobs and, you know, touching base with people and, uh, you know, sending congratulatory notes and, you know, remembering who had a baby and, you know, who may have lost a loved one. And, you know, it, I like people. I'm very much a people person. I'm an extrovert. So for me, this is kind of a natural extension of what I would do anyway. Um, and it shouldn't be predatory. Like I'm only engaging with you because I want something from you. But you know, professional relationships are the key towards professional growth. And so it's it's really nurturing those relationships, letting people know what you're interested in, what you want to be doing, um, putting it out there on social media. You know, when you're doing something, when you finally do something that you want to be doing, put it putting it out there about how excited you are about it, so that you can get more of it, so people can see like, oh, she's doing this now, and that will generate more work. So it's that whole matrix of relationships and kind of your your public what you put out public facing and you know all of that in terms of the actual like pitching process yeah I mean I'd, I'm trying to think of what almost everything I've done since I've left the network has come to me through relationships where somebody like for example with iHeart uh, a contact reached out and said we're creating a new department for women's lifestyle content do you have any ideas of a podcast you'd like to do and then we work together to create that podcast. So that came through a relationship. Um, you know, my work with the Dr. Oz Show, the executive producer was a producer I'd worked with at the Today Show many years back. And she said, you know, we really need someone to cover crime for us. We're doing a lot of crime. We need somebody who actually like knows how to cover like a case, you know, read documents and trials and all that, police reports. Um, and so that again was a relationship. So I would say relationships are the key. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Mike Hughes, <clears throat> uh, class of 2002, and the uh, second ever cohort of uh, CNS. So just oh, a you're cohort right after you. Yeah, right behind <laughs> you. I'm fascinated by your path to where you are now. And few people can predict where they'll be in, you know, 15 to 20 years. You went to undergrad. You went to get your master's here, and then you went into producing. Many people think they're going to get their undergraduate degree and go straight into broadcasting. So, tell us a little bit, if you if you will, about why you chose first to get a master's and then from there go into producing and not broadcasting? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, I knew I needed a master's degree because I knew I had no idea what I was doing in terms of how to be a reporter. My communications degree, like I remember I took a class on communication between doctors and patients and I was like, how am I gonna use this in my life? Like, I, it'll help me when I go to the doctor, but like other than that, it's not gonna help me much. So I knew that I needed some like actual professional training, which was why this program was so attractive to me because it would actually teach me how to do the job. And then beyond that, I never was like, I really want to be a reporter. I really want to be a producer. I just loved journalism and I loved being in a television newsroom. Loved it. It was like my skin would tingle when I would walk through the door. So I just knew I wanted to work in TV. And that was the job that I was offered. And it was in New York, which is where I wanted to be. And it paid me a ton of money. I made $28,000 a year. And I was like, this is great. This is amazing. And then the next opportunity came up and um, it, it was exciting and amazing. And then it, uh, that kind of led me down that path. But I'm a pretty serendipitous person. I think that the universe opening opens and closes doors to direct you. And if you listen, you will end up where you're supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so between the different uh, Broad broadcasting industries you work for, whether it's NBC, uh, networks, ABC, uh, CBS, what have you taken from other journalists that you've helped become a better broadcaster yourself? Things that I've learned from them that have made yeah, that, me better. Yeah, that, that, that you've used to help improve your skills. Yeah, iron sharpens iron, and working um, at the networks, you know, wow, they, they kicked my butt at first um, because they were so good, and I was so green. 
Um, and I felt like I would never, ever, ever live up to the level of work that they were doing. So, I mean, I think a, just surrounding yourself with the best is always going to really, really raise your game. Um, I know that helped me tremendously. Um, in terms of like specific lessons, you know, I, I'm not sure who and where I learned this from, but you know, I very much study people that I respect. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work very up close and personal with a lot of people that I respect. And I just find that, you know, authenticity, there are very few people who can fake authenticity on camera and it works. Some can, there are some phonies out there, but there are few, most people can't do that. It's incredibly difficult. So the biggest thing that I've found is you have to be authentically yourself because that's going to come across. So make sure that whatever you're doing, you are able to show up as your authentic self because if not, it's just not going to work. You know how like certain animals can tell or like babies can tell if someone's a good person or horses can tell if you're afraid of them. You know, the TV is like that for whatever reason. You have to be authentic or the viewer is not going to connect with you. And so that is, is very, very important to me always is trying to maintain that. Um, it's just it's 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 the TV is how the TV world works. <laughs> Cindy Wright, I'm the producing instructor and I spent 30 years in TV news prior to that. And I was listening to you talk about going through the Middle East by yourself on an American passport, <laughs> <laughs> cringing after I did the same but with a crew of four. Right. <laughs> did you ever feel like you had a target painted on your back? You know, I was blessed to be ethnically ambiguous, which I found when I left the United States, that when I, anytime, whenever I'm outside of the country, people are not quite sure where I'm from. You know, they, some people think maybe I'm Latina, people think, are you Egyptian? Um, but American is not necessarily the first thing that comes to mind for them. I, I guess I don't look like what people other, in other parts of the world think of when they think of an American. And so that worked very much to my advantage. Um, so I did not volunteer that I was American. Um, I would, you know, if somebody asked, I would tell them about the news organization I was reporting for. But most of them, like, for example, you know, NPR, Yahoo, th those I could have been based anywhere. Um, and if and when it did come up, I just tried to keep my mouth shut. I certainly wasn't going to get into a, a conversation about foreign policy, you know, <laughs> with somebody who's living, you know, from the effects of American foreign policy in a very practical day to day way. And I was, you know, but for the grace of God, go I. I was very, very, very lucky. I was absolutely in many, many, many dangerous situations by myself. Um, I, sometimes I cringe at night thinking of the positions I put myself in, but God protected me and I'm very grateful for that. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Okay. All right. So one of the questions is, how has keeping a healthy lifestyle impacted your career on television? And has it been a positive factor in your career as a journalist? Um, yeah. I mean, I think because it's so it can be so fast paced and so demanding. Um, I think part of, you know, the balance is really prioritizing. I mean, self care is talked about so much now, it kind of lost a little bit of its impact, but it's kind of like the, I mean, I, I like to think of myself as a house plant. I need sunlight, I need water, I need people to talk nicely to me. Like that, like those are the things that like I need to be okay. And I have to prioritize those things. And they're the little things. That's what makes the difference. Like giving myself five minutes to stretch in the morning it's not a huge, like, it's not like exercise that's gonna like give me abs or anything, but it clears my head, it helps me like start the day. Like I prioritize that no matter where I am. Um, so prioritizing the things that are important to you and making sure that you are absolutely at the top of your list. People say it all the time, it's become such a cliche, but it's the truth. Like you can't save anybody else if you yourself are drowning. So you have to make sure you're okay first and then you can do good work and then you can help people and then you can care for your family. But you have to be okay first um, and you have to be whole and you have to be happy. Um, so those things have to be your priority and you have to learn when to say no when your peace is being threatened and your well-being is being threatened um, because you are first and that's not selfish. It's always insane to me that the idea that we put ourselves first is selfish. No, that's sanity we're supposed to protect ourselves. Like, if not me, who's gonna protect me? I, I only got me, just me and God. So <laughs> um, I think it's very, very important to just managing a fast paced, stressful environment, you know? 
Anyone else have any more? I can just keep firing them off. <laughs> <laughs> Several people said your name as you walked up. Hey. So Eugene, I'm like, I'm, I'm scared. Hey, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And good evening, Mara. Good Eugene evening. Oba, in case everybody uh, did not know. But uh, class of 2011, uh, very happy to be here. And uh, I just wanted to pick up on one of the earlier points that was made, uh, that you actually made insofar as really, um, what these organizations choose to cover and choose not to cover is indicative of the society, but I would also say indicative of some of the powers that be. And we have seen a lot of good stuff and we've seen a lot of garbage, um, especially from Fox, One American News, etc., etc. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I think my point is, um, and what I want to ask you is, how can, and especially for the students that are here, how can they be empowered to continue to make sure that the news organizations, wherever they end up, hold you know, the powers that be accountable and making sure that the truth is being told? It's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly difficult. I wish I had a more hopeful response for you because <clears throat> people in glass houses don't like to throw stones. And so the journalism industry really hates self-examination and they're really loath to examine even their competitors too critically because they know that they have the same issues. And within the newsroom, I mean, if you look at newsrooms today, I, I would argue, and the reason I don't know this number statistically is because a lot of them refuse to provide their demographic data, which imagine if any other state of government refused to tell you the makeup of their um, employees, but news organizations are asked every single year to provide to the different um, minority journalist associations their demographic information, gender and racial breakdown of their employees. Some of them do it. The New York Times is very transparent about that. They make it available for all to see, including their readers. And a lot of the news organizations flat out refuse. They say no. So I, can, I don't even know the percentage of newsrooms that are white statistically, but I can tell you it's the majority by far. And so the problem that journalists of color face is it's, it's if you speak up too often, you will get penalized, not overtly, but it starts to create a little bit of a contentious relationship with people who are responsible for your professional advancement. So you have to be very judicious in when you're going to fight those battles. And they may be receptive to them and they may not. And you can't fight them all and you can't win them all. And I don't know how we change that. A lot of people have been trying to change that for a very long time and have made very little progress. And let me just also say just very quickly and then get back. But, um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I'm in 100% agreement. I, know, I mean, we've seen this, especially with Jamal Hill, um, you know, um, even Maria Taylor, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, it's like, yeah, as you said, you know, when people like us and, you know, others speak out, and say too much, then it's very, very, very much frowned upon. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, as you said, what we do about it, you know, I don't know, but I think, we you know, we still have to keep at it. We still have to keep fighting. It's, yeah, it's, but it's an exhausting fight. And I, for one, I fought it on the front lines. You ask anybody who's worked with me for a very long time, and I'm tired now, so now it's up to you guys. Um, I'm passing the torch. I want a little more peace in my life. <laughs> um, I'm still always going to fight the fight when it's appropriate, but not as often and not as loudly because I'm tired. Yeah, it's up to these guys. It's, it's, up, up, to to these it's guys. up to you guys. <laughs> it's yours now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Just to piggy off of that question, since there are so many people here getting into entering the journalism field, what is your advice on how to advocate for yourself? How to advocate for yourself in what, what way? Like the stories you want to cover or for your professional advancement salary? I guess as a whole, because if you're new coming in, you may think there's not much that you can say or there's not much that you can really contribute to either your growth or what you're doing as, as whatever position you're in. So how do you 
basically how are you able to speak up for yourself in that sense when you are new? Well, when it comes to stories, like trying to get things that are important to you covered, um, you know, everybody pitches. So just keep those pitches coming. And I mean, just make those a a regular part of the pitching process, things that are actually important to you and raising your hand and saying, like, don't discount it and assume, oh, they wouldn't care about this because it's just like saying, no, this is a really big deal in this space. And I really think we should be covering it Um, and being very confident in what you think is important because a lot of great, great, great reporting has come out of that. Great reporting has come out of someone who was told no 15 times. And finally on the 16th time, like, okay, fine, do it. And then that becomes a huge story. Um, So I think just being persistent in pitches um, and then relationships, which I'm always gonna go back to, you know, uh, making sure you have strong relationships at all levels. You know, networking is not just upward. It's also with people who are coming in and because there's so much mobility. Someone who's who's the intern today, I mean, Jeff Zucker was the executive producer of the Today Show at 28 or like 27. So there were people who he was their intern who a few years later, he was their boss. Like, you know, that, that things change quickly. So just keeping good relationships um, with, you know, as many people as possible, that will help you when you need something. So whether it's renegotiating a contract or salary, those good relationships go a very long way. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a freshman journalism major. Not sure what, you know, section of that yet. Still figuring that out. Um, you got time. Yeah, I got time. <laughs> but my question was, um, being like freelancing and traveling, how did you like deal with the unknown, the factor of like not knowing you're going to get a paycheck in or not knowing that you're going to get the call from, you know, the connection that you made the other week? Like, because I feel like that's so interesting to talk about, like, kind of how you keep your cool and keep producing and keep writing stuff while you're in the midst of this. You don't really know where you're going to go. Yeah, you mean like ha- the unknown of like paying the bills or when your yeah, next check like is just coming? Kinda. Yeah, no, that's real. Um, and that sales work, the business of being independent, that's a job in and of itself, you know, um, you know, figuring out what to charge and sending people invoices and making sure they're paying you on time and reviewing the contracts and having a lawyer that you can have review contracts. Like that's a whole job in and of itself. Um, but in terms of like how you pay the bills, that's a very real consideration. A lot of people would love to quit their job and, and just do freelance reporting and work on the things they're passionate about and make a living that way. But they're like, well, I have to pay rent. So if I quit this job, how am I going to pay rent? I have been very lucky in that I've been married a long time and having two incomes is very, very helpful when you want to quit your job because then somebody in the household still has a job. (laughs) And so that was key to me to being able to, um, just to know how the bills were gonna get paid, but I spent a lot of money I did not have. I put it on a credit card, on a faith. I was like on a wing and a prayer. And when I finally got a job, I was able to pay those bills down, but that was an investment in myself that I didn't know if I was ever gonna, it was gonna pay off and it did, thank goodness. Um, I say that to say, it doesn't, it's, you're not gonna get in it for the money at first. You know, yeah. be, starting out as a freelancer, it, it, no, you're not gonna be rich. If you can pay your bills, you're really successful. If you can pay your bills as a freelancer, you are doing great. And then over time, it does start to become more and more lucrative. You have regular, you know, relationships. People start to turn to you more for things and, you know, it, it shakes out. It's definitely the harder road. No question. Getting a paycheck is much easier. Yeah. The travel's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to go back to your other point really fast because it really surprised me and kind of made me sad that when we were talking about um, – holding truth to power and what what um, people or more seasoned um, individuals in the industry have to say about it, I feel like that's a question I've heard over and over again and um, that I've heard be answered kind of the same way with like hopeful optimism and like, oh, so I almost thought like I knew the answer to your question. So when you gave the actual answer to your question, I was kind of sad. I was like, oh, wow, like that's actually kind of scary. So growing up and having known that this is what I've wanted to do for a very long time. I've been able to put myself in spaces that I've been able to be mentored and taught and given this type of advice too. And I feel like even in school here, like we're taught, okay, no, you're gonna be able to hold truth power. Like they're holding us up to the standard of the industry that we almost like to how we think it's going to be. Um, So to hear what you said, what do you think is like a better way to prepare yourself 
for that reality that you were speaking for of. for when you say that reality kind of the imbalances in the newsroom yes i mean it's not that different from societal imbalances at large it's just a different kind of slice of it so i think as a black woman you are very well equipped to manage it you're here so you've managed it phenomenally well your entire life up until this point um, and I think a lot of those skills you're going to have to continue to use and you're ha going to have to continue to need. Um, I, I just I don't think things are going to change as quickly as any of us would like them to. But they are changing a little. You know, they change incrementally. Um, and I think it is really important to, you know, I don't want to be like Debbie Downer. Right. There are there are many, many, many positives we can point to um, in ways that things are changing for the better. And the very fact that I can have this conversation openly without fear of retribution, I would not have felt that way 15 years ago. I would have given you a very different, very vanilla, very bland, very easy to swallow answer that did not actually address the realities in any way, shape or form whatsoever. The fact that I can give an honest answer today because it's part of the national dialogue, I consider that to be progress because at least we can say, well, this is a really big problem and you have to start by identifying a problem before you can change it. So, uh, you know, in terms of how you navigate and you want to be hopeful and look to the people that are doing it and then do inspire you. So, for example, someone that I look to a lot is my very dear friend, Tamron Hall. You know, she left the Today Show um, very, pub well, not, she didn't make it public, but it was public because, you know, made news. She left the Today Show um, and Megan Kelly was given the hour that she was the anchor of. She was the first black female anchor of the third hour of the Today Show. Um, Megan Kelly got that hour and she left NBC. And now she is phenomenally successful with her own show, with her name on it. She's the executive producer. She has another black woman as the co-EP. And so you look to the things that give you inspiration, um, and you use those as your, your North Star. Thank you for your honesty. Mm -hmm. okay. it's so tall. Hi. Hello. Um, Ambie Nervula. I'm a alum, now I work with the university. Yay, go Terps. <laughs> <laughs> go Terps. <laughs> Never leaving College Park. <laughs> um, so my question is, I was curious to know about, you traveled so much on your own, you were by yourself on your own. How did you deal with the loneliness of like being on your own? And it was lonely, I'm sure, like, you know, being on your own, etc. And like, do you have a self-care routine, which you have used in the past or now used I guess now? Yeah, that's a great question. It actually was very lonely. Um, now, when I say alone, I always worked with locals to help me because I didn't speak the language and I didn't know the geography. So I always had people that I would like meet with in the morning who we would work together from, you know, eight to five or whatever the hour the case may be. Um, so I wasn't alone alone, but these were strangers. I didn't know them. And at the end of the day, I would go to the hotel by myself. Um, I realized very quickly uh, the hotel lobby is no place for a woman by herself because people think certain things about you that are not true. And so I, you can't even like go sit in the lobby to like decompress. You've got to stay in your room. Um, so it was incredibly lonely. And the work that I do now is lonely to some extent, you know, because I'm with people when I'm working on a project. You know, I just spent a week with a full crew in studio. But then when I'm, you know, doing pitches or doing kind of some of the back end stuff, that's alone, you know. And so there is, a, I prefer working in teams. And that is something that I really, really enjoy and that I really miss when it's not, um, you know, something that's part of that particular day. So it, it kind of makes me just appreciate it more when I am working, you know, in, in the team environment. Um, in terms of self-care, you know, I'll be honest, my self-care has really, you know, like cleaned up in the last, I'm not, now at this point it's been about 10 years. But when I was younger, it was like I was drinking too much. I was overeating. I was, you know, do, I was doing all the self-medicating when I really was exhausted and I just wanted to sleep more. But I was so, so go, 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 go that I didn't sleep and I didn't rest and I didn't, didn't give myself breaks ever. I worked seven days a week for years and um, I dealt with that, you know, in, in ways that were not so healthy for me. Now it's the complete opposite. Like, I'm the most boring person in the world. I'm in bed at 9 o'clock. I wake up at 6 to do my stretches. I have my lemon water. Like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but those are the things that keep me happy and sane. And, you know, they're just, they're healthier coping mechanisms. They actually make me better as opposed to deplete me. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah. Oh, good. Nice. So I'm going to be wearing this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. You are very welcome. So thank you all for coming out. Again, for those of you who are along on this event, we will see you at our future events. Those of you who will be graduating this year, next year, maybe a few years after that. We hope you'll be a part of what we do and, and join us and give us your ideas. So thank you all for coming and out. And I'm going to write my email. Oh, Hey, so you were the year after me. Yeah. Huh?